I'm a clinical psychologist who helps people with insomnia. One of my clinical interests is sleep. I love talking about sleep. I love researching sleep. I love learning about the research regarding sleep. And I'm here to provide a brief overview about how to help your clients who struggle with insomnia. You don't have to be an insomnia expert to know the underpinnings of sleep and how to get better sleep, how to get better quality sleep, and how to reduce awakenings. As a clinical psychologist who specializes in insomnia, I mostly do cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, which is the first line treatment for chronic insomnia above medications, which is incredible. For people who are experiencing difficulty falling asleep, staying asleep, waking up before their intended alarm, or they're waking up feeling incredibly dissatisfied about sleep, the underpinnings of cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia would be super helpful. Thinking about the whole protocol of CBTI could become overwhelming. It's really important to get trained on the manual and know how to like prescribe a bed window, um, how to look at sleep data, how to analyze a sleep diary. All of that is very intense. At a very basic level, we can focus on the major underpinnings of sleep to help people achieve better sleep even without this training. Of course, we want our clients to get the best care that they possibly can. So if you notice that insomnia is one of the core presenting issues, you definitely want to get some more help um, and refer them to a sleep specialist. For those clients who have different presenting concerns and insomnia is maybe a small part, I think it is helpful to just know some quick tips of how to help your clients with this issue. When I think about the underpinnings of sleep, I think of three pillars. The first is circadian rhythm, which is our body's natural sleep-wake cycle. The second is sleep drive, which is the body's biological need for sleep. And the third is arousal or thought patterns or anxiety that might hinder us from falling asleep. When I think about circadian rhythm, I think about people who are able to achieve a very consistent routine. So people who wake up around the same time every day, they start their bedtime routine around the same time every day. They're pretty consistent in potentially meals when they're eating, how much water they're drinking. Of course, eating and drinking don't always increase our ability to maintain a good circadian rhythm. I think the more consistent that we are in our habits, the easier it is to notice those internal cues of sleepiness around the time that people are intending to go to sleep. So internal cues of sleepiness are like nodding off, feeling completely exhausted. It would probably be really irresponsible to get behind the wheel of a car if you feel these internal cues of sleepiness. So for circadian rhythm, I always suggest, hey, if you're able to wake up around the same time every day, that would be incredible. Not everybody has that privilege or opportunity. So for example, a lot of the questions that I get are from shift workers. Hey, I'm working all these different shifts. I'm on nights, then I'm on days, then I'm on swing shifts. What do I do? My suggestion would be to try to find any sort of consistency. In your routine. Maybe it's picking up certain shifts on certain days, maybe one day, Monday, Wednesday, Friday or nights, Tuesday, Thursdays or swing shifts, something like that. Of course, if we could maintain just nights or just days, that would be ideal for our schedule, but not everybody has that luxury. So we might suggest all of these things and then we have to kind of make them unique to the person. The second pillar that I like to talk about is sleep drive, the body's biological need for sleep. What does that mean? It's similar to hunger drive. When I explain it to my clients, I think about, okay, when you eat a piece of cake, your hunger drive goes down because you're not hungry anymore because you just ate. When you sleep the whole night, your sleep drive is low because you've slept the entire night. Increasingly, as time goes on, that sleep drive increases. There are some things that clients do that impact that sleep drive, and then it impacts them falling asleep at the time that they're preferring to fall asleep at night. Here are some things to consider. Exercise, caffeine use, napping. Those are the three big ones. So with napping, I'm, I never really discourage naps, but I ask the client, do you want consolidated sleep at night or do you want to sleep a little bit in the day and then a little bit at night? If we have expectations around sleep that we're napping and then we're going to sleep a full eight hours, usually people can't achieve that because their body doesn't need that much sleep because the body's biological need for sleep is not high. When we exercise, it increases that sleep drive. So if we're exercising at least 30 minutes a day or walking or we're a little more mobile rather than sitting on a desk or sitting at a desk, it increases that sleep drive too. On that same note, when people are intellectually or mentally stimulated, that also may increase sleep drive. So if they're using their brains all day, if they're really, really, really working, um, if they're engaged all day, it's likely that they might feel more exhausted at night. As you can see, if we're a little more sedentary, our sleep drive might be a little lower. And now caffeine. Most people struggle with this. Most people that I see, and I've struggled with it too. Caffeine is just, coffee's great, right? And this all depends on the client's bed window. If they have a traditional bed window where they're falling asleep around like 10, 11 or midnight, we suggest to limit caffeine use. Um, for example, I don't drink caffeine after noon 
because I'm really, really sensitive to caffeine. Different substances, different medications have different half-lives. It's important to consider caffeine as you navigate sleep health with your client. They might be drinking like three energy drinks a day um, and then getting really frustrated about the fact that they're not tired or they're waking up a lot at night. There are other people out there who can drink coffee or caffeine or tea and it seemingly doesn't affect them in terms of falling asleep. I tend to get curious about the quality of their sleep. And the last one is arousal. When I think of arousal, it to me is a fancy word for thinking and anxiety, uh, just in plain terms. So if people are in their bed, ruminating, thinking, going down that thought spiral, and they're really, really, really cognitive, like they're in their head thinking about things, it's most likely going to inhibit us from sleeping. I like to give the example of the theory of when we were hunter-gatherers. If you are fearful and you are thinking about a bear in the woods, you're probably not going to sleep because you're anxious, right? And that anxiety is going to keep you safe in that one way because then you won't get eaten while you're asleep. You could have the most consistent circadian rhythm and you can have a really, really, really high sleep drive. If you are anxious at night, that anxiety will keep you up no matter what, no matter what you're doing, because it's our body's way of keeping us safe. So when I work with people on sleep treatment, I always ask them, what sort of things are you stressed about? What's keeping you up at night? What sort of thoughts do you have about sleep? What are the beliefs that you have about sleep? For example, some people might say, I was never a good sleeper and history shows that I'm not going to be a good sleeper. Some people might feel anxious about, you know, safety concerns, safety issues. Then we have to think about the things that are out of our control. When we think about discrimination, racism, uh, we think about all these things that most people don't have control over that keep them up at night. We don't have solutions for those. It's easy to say, oh, just stop thinking about it or, hey, just let that go. It's no big deal. Well, it is a big deal for that client. For anxiety at night, if the client really does struggle with this, I usually um, prescribe scheduled worry time. And I'll provide a link there for you. It's a cognitive behavioral tactic um, that's actually helpful for people who have trouble compartmentalizing as well. So for people at work, if they're thinking about you know, personal stuff or they're thinking about a stressful situation in life um, and it's taking them away from their work, we usually engage in scheduled worry time. Scheduled worry time has three parts. Um, it's worry identification, worry delay, and then worry time. So worry identification is noticing when you have those thoughts that cause anxiety and that anxiety keeps you up at night. And I'll just give an example. Maybe somebody is thinking about a presentation that they have at work that's coming up and they're very nervous about it. They're identifying the fact that they are worrying. The second is worry delay. This is really hard for people. So you're going to identify the fact that you're worrying and you're going to say, hey, my scheduled worry time today is at 1 p.m. So I have to actually wait to think about this until then. People do have to gain, engage in a little bit of distress tolerance skills, I, I notice, because uh, it is really stressful to say, I'm having this thought and I can't engage in this thought right now. It's just this weird thing. I kind of like to see it as a great challenge, an experiment to say, hey, um, you don't really have solutions for that right now and you can't act on that right now. So you may as well just challenge yourself to wait a little bit unless it's a situation in which they have to act immediately or it's unsafe or something. Then the third is the scheduled worry time. So I tell people to set a timer for 15 minutes. People want to spend a little more time because they're like, I have so many thoughts. We usually set a timer for 15 to 30 minutes and you allow your mind to just go there. You allow your mind to worry, worst case scenario, catastrophize, the whole nine. Towards the end, people start to notice like, I'm having the same thought over and over again. I'm having the exact same thought over and over again, or I'm having the same flavor of thoughts over and over again. And when you're engaging in worry time, worry is helpful to identify the the things that we need to change. It's not so helpful if we stay there. It's almost like being in a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but you're not getting anywhere. Towards the end of that worry time, just say the timer's for 15 minutes. I start to notice that people try to come up with solutions. Some problems don't have solutions. They just don't. They don't have solutions that we could act on. They don't have solutions that seem viable at the time, or they have solutions that just seem unattainable at the moment. If that's the case, I always tell my clients to ask themselves, is it actually helpful for me to be thinking about this in the amount of intensity and depth that I am? A lot of times people say, no, I need to, I need to. I get it. Your mind wants to go there. You have those automatic negative thoughts. You have those intrusive thoughts. And just because we have a thought doesn't mean that it's actually helpful to stay there. I think it's important to validate the concern. It's important to say, wow, this is an issue. I am having feelings about this. I am really fearful about this. Holding space for that is incredibly important. And I notice a lot of my clients don't give themselves enough credit um, when they are having these thoughts because they're like, I don't know why I just can't get over this. Well, because it's a big deal. The challenge point here is to allow yourself to take a rest from thinking about it. Because if you keep thinking about it, it's not so helpful. If people are able to engage in worry time, then it's less likely that they'll be thinking about these thoughts right before bed. And if they notice those thoughts coming up, they could tell themselves, hey, I spent 30 minutes, 30 minutes worrying about this today, and I came up with no viable solutions. I don't know if it's actually helpful for me to be thinking about this 
right now as I'm trying to go to bed. It's not going to get me to the goal of actually falling asleep. This isn't an exhaustive list of how to handle insomnia issues with your clients, but if you are a clinician and you don't have the training and you really, really want to know more, those three pillars of sleep are important to focus on. And a lot of times people notice pretty good results if they're a little consistent, they have high sleep drive, and they're really challenging their thoughts at night. I'll provide some resources below. Please ask any questions that you have about sleep. And if there are any other sleep specialists out there and you want to contribute something, please feel free to comment. See you soon.